Okay, uh, I'm going to give you a brief bio on Chris. Chris Hughes co-founded Facebook as a student at Harvard, later led Barack Obama's digital organizing campaign for president in 08. He was the owner and publisher of the New Republic from 2012 to 2016, and is now the co-founder of the Economic Security Project, a network of policymakers, academics, technologists, and so on, working to end poverty and rebuild the middle class through guaranteed income. And his first book is Fair Shot, Rethinking Equality and How We Earn. Inequality. <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> yes, Rethinking Inequality. <laughs> yeah. So, um, your work since Facebook, Chris, seems to be purpose-driven to make the world a better place, I mean, Obama 08, uh, what you were trying to do with the New Republic, the Economic Security Project. How does your time at Facebook fit that pattern? Did you go into Facebook thinking you were doing good? And if so, when did that change? Well, um, first off, thanks for having me. Thank you, Terrence, for the conversation this evening and for all of you guys for coming out. It's, uh, I don't get to LA that often. I live in New York, so it's a privilege to be here despite the bizarre weather. Um, <laughs> or at least for me, bizarre weather. Um, so, yeah, I talk in the book about um, the early days of Facebook and um, you know the rocket ship rise. So, um, just to set the scene for a second, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina, Hickory, North Carolina. It's at the foot of the Appalachian Mountains. My dad was a, a traveling paper salesman. My mom was a public school teacher. Very middle class kind of life. We were um, a pretty religious family. My parents had pretty much always been um, uh, conservative and uh, uh, voted for Republicans. It was just very much what, what you might expect of a rural southern kind of upbringing. I ended up getting a scholarship to go to um, a fancy boarding school and then another scholarship to go to Harvard and was there on financial aid. There, I roomed with Mark Zuckerberg and we started Facebook in the winter of our sophomore year and um, it, uh, it exploded. And my life changed so dramatically. Now, even though we've read about it, we've seen the movie and so on, how quickly did it explode? Uh, slower in some ways than you might think. Um, it all depends on what the goalpost is, right? So when we launched it, uh, 6,000 Harvard students signed up within three weeks. So everybody was talking about it. We launched a few more schools. Similarly, uh, uh, it, it exploded at those schools. However, Facebook was just for college kids for two and a half years. It wasn't open to the rest of the world until the summer or um, a fall of uh, uh, 2006. And then if you look at the historic growth curve, the growth really happens around 2008 when uh, there's an inflection point and then the time on the site uh, uh, really explodes once again after that when everybody gets mobile phones and that's when the, the usage pattern changes. But to answer your, your initial question, yeah. Mark always saw Facebook as a mission. And I talk about this in the book. For him, it was a cause. To connect the world was good for the world. For me, my perspective was, I, I liked Facebook, I was proud of what we did. I worked on the product, the marketing, the communications teams, and I found it to be a challenge and, and to be rewarding. However, for me, it was a place to hang out online. You know, it was a place to connect with, with friends and keep up with, with family, but, um, it was a little more prosaic than, uh, than the kind of like crusade almost that it was for Mark. And for, I mean, for that reason, I stayed at the company for uh, uh, about three years and then I left to go work on Barack Obama's campaign and then to do many other things. But the reason that I wrote the book was not just to articulate my own role in the, in, in the Facebook story, it's specifically to make the case that um, I got extremely lucky. For three years worth of work, the financial return that I got was nearly half a billion dollars. <laughs> and there is nothing to call that but a lucky break. But the, 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 the issue is, is that I, I'm not alone. 
And we talk in our society like the American dream is still very much alive and well. I think it's on life support and in danger of dying because a small group of people keeps getting consistently lucky while everybody else struggles to make ends meet. So hopefully we can talk a little bit more about that tonight. But ultimately, I think that we have to, to wrestle with, with why my story is possible in a moment when everybody else is, is struggling and what we can do to change that because there's quite a lot we can't do. Very good. So um, we will definitely talk about your current work and about the book and the larger purpose uh, behind that. But um, when I thought about it, I thought, looking at the timing of this interview and the fact that you were A, co-founder of Facebook, and B, head of digital campaign for a presidential campaign, you're pretty uniquely qualified <laughs> on both counts to talk about what's happened in 2016. Um, uh, 17 and 18, too. Yeah, but I'm saying <laughs> that, you know, the election was affected in 16. Yes. Um, so what we've learned about micro-targeting, about hacking, about bots, about fake news, about yes. Russia, about Macedonia, right? All this yes. stuff. How much of that did you guys, back in those early days, even imagine? Did you have conversations about unintended consequences? In the earliest of days, no. In the earliest of days, it was about enabling people to connect with friends and family, hang out online, chat, you know, and the more connection, the better, right? That, that was the idea. It was almost like Mark often talked about Facebook as a social utility, which ironically is coming back in a moment when we're talking about antitrust competition monopolies. The utility language compares it to something like the phone lines or the water pipes, but there was a sense that like, we've got to lay the pipes for everybody to connect in a new way. Right, there's a vision be of the so, way things can be. So yeah. in terms of, did we sit around in our dorm room thinking about unintended um, consequences? Um, in the early days, no. And I think that that kind of pattern lasted for uh, for too long. I think that you know, as Facebook grew, there was an increasing sense of responsibility and uh, more, as more and more people used it that, that people could not use it uh, for good. But so many mistakes were made in the 2016 election. And I would say, particularly with something like the Cambridge Analytica scandal, so many mistakes that were foreseeable that I think that there is real responsibility. And it's on Mark, Cheryl, the whole management of the company today. I too feel a sense of responsibility for having been there at the beginning. I left the company a decade ago, but, uh, but, uh, but I, I feel that responsibility to myself. So um, the question is, is what happens? What happens now? But let me ask just a little bit more, dig a little more. So, um, okay, you didn't talk about it way back then. Even though you've been away from the company, what surprised you about the negative that's taken place, and we will say specifically with, with, um, with the election and, and, and the, what we keep finding out. What surprised you and what didn't? Well, I think that the thing that I, we spend a lot of time talking about um, the Russian hacking, the you know buying ads and targeting them, the rise of fake news. Recently, we've talked a lot about privacy, data, and regulation. As we've talked about all of that, I think we've overlooked the fundamental values that have been behind the newsfeed algorithm in the first place. Okay. The reality is Facebook has been structured to reward the most outrageous voices. You know, the, the, the extreme people who say the most controversial, controversial things outperform in newsfeed. I mean, by some analysis, for Hillary Clinton to have had the same reach that Donald Trump had, in the 2016 election, just on the Facebook newsfeed itself, she would have had to have spent something like $6 billion. To get what he got for free. To get what he got for a very small yeah, amount, yeah, for millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. Right, they were both paying for ads, but as you, anybody who knows about how Facebook works, there's the paid reach and then these the organic reach, which is anything but organic. There are engineers who are creating algorithms who, who you know decide what values will, will uh, will drive them. So the idea that it's organic is, is truly a, a misnomer. It's, there, there are people who are, who are making those decisions. So when you ask what, what's most surprising, I think that at the same time as we're talking about each of these scandals, because God knows there have been 
so many. We should also be talking about the structure of uh, many of the Facebook products themselves and asking what will be different this time in, in 2018. And they have made some changes. They've changed the algorithm, rewarding comment, more comments and discussion. And I think that's a, a step in the right direction. But we won't really know in the US context until September, October of this year when we have another election, how much has, um, has fundamentally changed on that count. To some extent, we won't know until after the election. Well, I think we will know some during the lead up to it, but in the time after the election, yeah, we'll have an even better sense. Yeah, yeah. Even better sense then. Um, so, okay, so, so you said some of the fundamental things, in other words, one can say people abused it. One can say Cambridge Analytica, the guy did a survey that he shouldn't have spread around, that he took him. But some of it, as you say, is in the nature of just the way it's set up. So. A, what are a couple of those things besides just the fact that it rewards uh, outrage and it, it, it rewards heat more than light, right? Um, and, and how, what should we be doing and what are they doing now as far as you know to fix those? Well, some of the things I was articulating before, I mean, I do think that the, the structure of the newsfeed is the most problematic uh, thing when it comes to political discourse in the country. And they are doing things to... to to work against that. They're also doing things on the fake news front. They're hiring people um, uh, very quickly to try to solve that problem. They say that they're applying artificial intelligence to that too. We will see. I mean, it's, it's um, I commend the efforts to try to, to address these things, but I'm also not here to, I'm not, a, I'm not at Facebook. I don't know any Facebook stock these days. I'm not here to, to um, by any means say that they, they have got it all figured out. I'm, I'm waiting like, probably most of you are, to see what happens. I think at the same time, though, as we're talking about Facebook's responsibility, we should zoom out and talk about the role that public policy and regulation should be playing on each one of these categories of problems, on privacy and data. I mean, we need to, I think, people, consumers, citizens, users of these platforms need basic assurances that their data is safe, secure, and not going to leak. I think that Let me ask people a should be on paid for that data. Mo I, think, most, I think there's a lot of public policy changes. Most of just us, started. I think, and I'm, I'm among them, when you get that thing, do you agree to these terms? Who has time to know whether I agree to these terms? I agree to these terms. Right. And we all do that. How do we fix that? Well, there are some people who are talking about shifting the law that governs ah. those terms to what's called a fiduciary responsibility. This is going to sound really dry, but just bear with me <laughs> for one second. So you know how your relationship to your lawyer, to a doctor, to a priest or a psychotherapist even, is actually considered different in the eyes of the law? Because each of those individuals has an asymmetric power relationship to you as an individual. The idea is that the lawyer knows so much more about the law and is in a position of guidance, or, or a psychotherapist knows so much more. So if you think about what's happening, not just with Facebook, but with Google and these other companies too, right now you have two billion people worldwide plugged in to these, uh, these companies, and the companies know immense amounts of information about where we go, who we're friends with, who we talk to, who we don't, to, uh, don't talk to, so much so that they can predict future behavior. And not only do they know that about one of us as an individual, it's like a psychotherapist knowing all of it about everyone, and then being able to, and, and right now we're, we, we trust these platforms to work with advertisers to say, we know what you're going to like, and then just ever so gently place it in front of you at the exact right moment. Now, that is the business model as it exists, but there, I think that there are big questions as a society and, and, and as a country that we should ask about whether or not that is an acceptable relationship, or instead, if we should recategorize the relationship that we have to companies like Facebook or Google and say that they actually have more of that fiduciary responsibility, like a doctor or a lawyer. Because or of the some power relationship. Have. Exactly. Now, the, the implications here um, are, uh, are, are 
significant, and they would, would raise fundamental questions about the business model, and, and I'm not here to say this is like what we should do tomorrow, but it is, I think, the kind of question that we should be asking. And, and, and um, it, it feels like the era when we just say, yep, agree, yeah. click agree to the terms of service. I mean, we all know as a society that we are, that, 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 is, that, is, not, uh, that is not playing an effective role, that it, at, on the other side of that, the tech companies in particular, and banks and other institutions where you're signing those, your, your rights away so quickly, end up with all the power, and people end up uh, powerless. And that balance, I think, has to change. Um, and one thing I, I want to have you address is the focus, it seems to me, has been on Facebook. Uh, yeah. You know, Facebook plus, plus Cambridge Analytics plus um, some Russians, you know, that gets all the attention. Other companies that we're not even talking about have enormous amounts of information on us oh, huge. and are using it like crazy. Can well, you talk just a little bit about the, mean, the, what's well, behind connects, the curtain, sort of? Yeah, well, this connects a bit with, um, with what I... What, the reason that I wrote the book, is, um, the amount of data that we're creating is enormous, and not just on Facebook or Google phones. You know, Alexa's listening to what you're saying in your house. Your phones are tracking where you're going. If you have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, it literally knows your heart rate this moment, let alone how, mu how many hours you slept last night. I mean, we could go through, and uh, not to mention the, the loyalty card that you use at the grocery store to get your discount, where they track every single thing that you're, you're buying. And so I don't say that to just you know, scare people, um, but I say it because it, over the past 15 years, the amount of data that we've created has exploded, and what's more, a small set of companies is making an enormous, enormous amount of money off of this data. I mean, Facebook made $15 billion last year, but their profits are up significantly this year. That's Google's right. are up by 80%. And it's not just tech companies, it's insurance, it's retail companies, it's finance companies as well. So one of the things that I think we should think about is, uh, is a way to balance, to, to, to level that playing field and say, not only do these companies need to protect the data that we are voluntarily creating, it's also reasonable to expect them to pay a share of that. That's right. Four or five percent of that as a dividend to everybody to make sure that everybody has uh, a share in the upside. We have a template for how to do this. They do it in Alaska. They use oil to capitalize their fund. Every Alaskan gets a check for 1500 bucks. Yeah, and you're going over that very, you're, you're going going over this very quickly. You're going over that very quickly. For people who don't know it, in Alaska, they passed a bill years ago that their biggest income comes from mining and oil. And what they do is they have fees that the uh, companies pay, the resource companies pay, and that is divided among every adult or every citizen. Every single every person. Citizen. Every citizen. Every single up, resident of the state of Alaska. It ends up being $1,400, $1,500 a year um, everyone gets because they live in Alaska. And Jerron Lanier was the first one who talked about this uh, in his book, Who Owns the Future, as far as I knew. I interviewed him years ago. That, um, first of all, the premise is um, that any service that is free, you are the product, right? In other words, we know for years, TV acted like they were selling sitcoms and dramas. What they were selling was your eyeballs, right? And uh, uh, social media has taken that to you know, on steroids. Um, one thing when I asked Lanier, because Lanier said we should get a piece of it, and he said not just the stuff we purposely share, but even the stuff we accidentally Passively. share, right? Yeah. And I said, well, but that sounds so complicated. He said, if you knew the algorithms they have now to do what they want to do, it ain't so complicated. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to say though that this this uh, you know this kind of a data dividend that would give every American uh, uh, a check for I mean it could be as as much as five hundred dollars now, but if the if the amount of data continues to increase as many people expect, it could add up to a thousand, fifteen hundred, maybe even more. I think the reason that I'm interested in it is because I think it could be a tool to fight back against income inequality and wealth inequality, which is the reason that. Um, I wrote the book, and it could be 
it, it could help to rebalance the playing field, not alone, guaranteed income, uh, you know, higher wages, monopoly uh, enforcement, um, et cetera, all need to happen at the same time. But I think it could be a big piece. It has to happen, though, in conjunction with, um, with laws that protect that data and also protects uh, individuals' uh, decision not to participate. So I don't want to sound like a data dividend is um, it, w without those kinds of protections, and in some ways it could be a perverse justification of a business model that many people don't want to, to participate in. So I think it has to happen in conjunction with privacy protections. Yes, and with, yes. With, with, oh, in with other that. words, not just create like a total outlaw environment, but we'll pay you to be in that like Westworld or something. Right, we'll I think that would, be, that, would, that, that would be, um, that would be, that would be a very But to both clean up the environment outcome and pay people exactly. for their participation because exactly. that is their product. Which is, again, how we've done it with other things like oil. You know, you have regulations about the safe extraction of natural resources, and in Alaska they say that everybody's going to get a share of, of uh, the revenue. So those things go, go hand in hand, and data is not... That is different than oil in that it's a renewable resource, but it's also a common wealth. It's something that we're all creating, and I think as a result, we all have um, the right to uh, uh, some of the profits that it makes so possible. So we're going to move to the book and the questions around inequality. Um, but I wanted to piggyback on one thing you said when you were talking about your story, and a word you used was luck. Mm -hmm. You know, you 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 got into Harvard. You happened to room with someone, and the the you know, the two and three of you that met, created something, and so on. Michael Lewis, mm. um, I'm going to read a quote from Michael. He says, I feel that we, and he, made, he, made a, he, he went back to Princeton and did a, an address in which this was his main point. He said, I feel we have to be sensitive to the imbalance of life's outcomes. Life's outcomes, while not entirely random, have a huge amount of luck baked into them. Above all, recognize that if you have had success, you have also had luck, and with luck comes obligation. And I think that really sort of segues right into what you're attempting to do. Michael speaks to this so eloquently. For anybody who's interested in this, you should go read the, this commencement speech. He gave it at Princeton. I mean, he specifically traces his own story. He, got, he went to a dinner party when he was a trader of derivatives and just happened to sit beside the wife of some of of a banker which enabled him to get this job, which enabled him to write uh, you know, his first book and everything sort of cascaded from there. And he's like, what's the luck that I got into Princeton, that I had this job, that I sat next to this woman? You know, he just traces it so elegantly, but he's not alone. You know, Bill Gates, even Mark Zuckerberg, uh, there are a lot of people who, um, who have been very successful in the sense that they've made a lot of money or been very good at what they, um, they do, who think that we undervalue the role that luck plays. Yeah. And in my own case, I mean, my case is, is extreme. I, I, I'm the first to say that uh, I got very lucky. I, I did work hard to get into Harvard. I did work hard <laughs> at Facebook. But the thing is, is like the, the way that we talk about luck and work, usually it's never the twain shall meet, right? Like this guy over here was the lucky roommate of Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg worked very hard for everything. One person is a lucky trust fund kid. Another has worked herself up or himself up from bootstraps. And in reality, these things are much more intertwined. You know, one of the things that I, I think is true is that some of the business leaders out there who sort of take issue when, yeah. when people start talking about luck, I, I think that they are very hardworking people often. They're also very lucky. And the, the people who come and clean their offices in the evening are also very hardworking people, but they are not fortunate. They are not benefiting from luck. The, the one issue, though, that I have with using the word luck mm. is that it implies that it's a lottery, right? Like, that, like oh, just life happens. Blind luck. It's like a blind thing. When in reality, we have written the rules of the road for the economy that we live in, and those rules are, it, ha, have been specifically constructed to help the 1% and the people who have been the m most fortunate capture more and more of the wealth. And it's, and it's um, y you know, the, the legacies of, uh, of gender discrimination, of racism in our country. The rules have very specifically configured the game to create massive windfalls for a select few, while median wages and household incomes for everybody else have 
stagnated since roughly the 1970s. So I think we should and must talk about luck, but let's not act like it's just fate that's happening. There, there are, there are uh, uh, people who are making very specific decisions to engineer luck to happen the way that it has been happening. Yeah. And I will just offer a, a recommendation. Winner Take All Politics by book. Hacker yeah. and Pearson is really that point. It's okay, this is what it looks like. What were the decisions, the policy decisions that were bought and enacted that, that led to this? So let's switch now to the notion here. Um, you obviously, uh, what we've just talked about sets you where you're seeing, I rose from the middle class to be very wealthy, I was lucky, I worked hard. Inequality is getting worse. Um, you didn't just sit down and write this book. What was your, what was the, your movement from that, that feeling like, I want to do something about this to now? Right. Um, well, my, here's, what, here's what happened with me. So Facebook went public in 2012, and um, I came into a lot of wealth, and my husband and I made a commitment to give away the vast majority of this wealth in the course of our lifetimes. We, we both felt like we're stewards of this. Let's invest it in nonprofits and causes that we believe in. We were immediately overwhelmed. I mean, there were just no shortage of causes and different things that we wanted to, to support. And we started doing um, some work, and we did some good things about it, uh, or with it, but it was, uh, it, it, there, there were so, so many directions to go in. So I took a step back and said, okay, well, what is the most effective thing that we can do? What, what's gonna be, dollar for dollar, what's gonna be the most impactful thing that we, can, that we can give to? And I have a whole chapter in the book about this journey. And I did start internationally and um, thought a lot about international poverty, economic opportunity internationally, and um, uh, did you, a lot of work with a few other nonprofits. One thing that I think is a great example in that point is the two trips you took to Kenya. Yeah, they sort of contrast, they compare and contrast in that, in that chapter in the, in the book. One trip I took to Kenya, I went um, and toured a, a big nonprofit that this world-renowned economist, had said, Jeff Sachs, had set up called the Millennium Villages. The idea was that if we just pour enough money into these villages, if we just create all of this social infrastructure around it, then we can eradicate extreme poverty in our lifetime. It's a pretty inspiring idea. And what they did is they paid literally for everything. So I went to a village that was on the Kenya-Somalia border that um, was full of, um, of people who had uh, been part of nomadic tribes, and they were building roads, building schools, building dormitories, um, health you know, facilities. healthcare facilities, porta potties, trash collection, agricultural subsidies, fertilizer, you name it. That was the theory. And I talk about visiting the, the village and, um, you know, we, we started a tour and we go to the, the dormitory and um, it's really hot outside. And I'm nauseous. <laughs> uh, and it's unclear if it's the food or if it's the ride or, or what. And so I duck into the dormitory. I like take a detour from the tour and there's nothing inside. There's no blankets, no like books, no pencils, nothing, even in amongst extreme poor. I'm like, where is the, all the kid's stuff? So I go back outside, I was like, where are the kid's stuff? And the, the tour guide says, oh, we cleaned before you guys came. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I don't know. I could, it could be lost in translation. I'm, I mean, <laughs> really, um, so I said, okay. So we go to the health clinic, looked very similar, spick and span, has anyone ever used this thing? And, and then later on, we went to the education building, and they're super excited to show me the computer, right? Because I'm the tech oh. guy on the tour, and Ericsson has set up a cell phone tower, so they, in theory, have satellite internet, but it's behind this grill, and it's got a padlock on it, and the teacher's like, here's our computer, and it's so great, we're connected to the World Wide Web. And I was like, oh, great, so what do you guys use the computer for? Everything. Oh, well, what, what, like, what kind of stuff? Oh, well, we use it really, really, really for everything. It's very helpful. And again, I'm like, what is going on? And then I asked one more time because I'd come halfway across the world and um, I got the same answer a third time. And finally, one of the nonprofit staffers, a woman who lived in Nairobi or New York, volunteered that they used it for lesson plan 
uh, development. And the guy who was giving the tour um, reiterated that too. And it turns out a couple years later, a journalist came behind me and um, everything that I s s happened to sense in this thing was right. That computer was stolen. The, um, the villagers were not really living there. The dormitories were, were empty. It was, it was a disaster and they ended up shutting down the village. So I tell that story in the book not to say that it's not important to, um, uh, uh, to work to alleviate extreme poverty. It's just that appearances are not always what they seem. And I contrast that with um, a group that I ended up getting very involved with called Give Directly, which has a really um, counterintuitive approach, but it's the, it's the seed or the kernel of the idea of behind a guaranteed income today, which is that the most effective way to provide economic opportunity to people in Africa, to people in Europe, to people in the United States, to people down the street in Santa Monica, is to give them cash. And there are actually hundreds of studies that show that dollar for dollar, it is the most efficient way to help improve education outcomes, health outcomes. People don't waste it on you know, drugs, alcohol, cigarettes. They tend to work just as much, if not more. And it creates a sense of, of financial security. So I came in through that international door and then began to think a lot more about income inequality here in the United States in the years after Facebook's IPO, and then have come now to believe that um, we have the power to eradicate poverty in our generation, that cash can and should be that tool. The challenge that we all have, and hopefully we can talk about in some of the questions and I can get your thoughts on, is how to build the political will to make that happen. But short of that, there is a lot of talk, uh, and I've actually interviewed some folks talking about guaranteed basic yes. income or universal basic income, and um, that is not what you're suggesting in the book. Is it still under consideration by the uh, the, the the consortium, the pro the project that you're working well, on? Well, I make the case for a cousin of that idea. So the the idea of a universal basic income. Some of you probably are super familiar with it, and some maybe a little bit less. So um, just briefly, the idea is often these days talked about in the context of the rise of the robots. So a concern that jobs are going to go away, that mass automation, artificial intelligence are going to reduce the amount of work that's possible. And so thus we need to create a kind of social insurance, a floor. Give every American $1,000 a month to make sure that um, people can cope with this, with this future. So where I, I'm inspired by the, the values behind you know, providing people with cash and the empirical evidence behind it. Where I diverge with that a bit is I am not convinced that the end of work is imminent. nigh, is, yeah, is imminent. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, and we can, if it's of interest, talk about that more. I'm much more oriented around social and economic justice today. And what we already know is that jobs are coming apart in America. You know, all the jobs that we've created in the past decade are gig economy jobs, part-time, contract, temporary, flexible, quote unquote, those kinds of, of jobs. We already know that the cost of living is up by 30%, even though wages are, are flat uh, uh, across the country. We already know that the idea that if you work, you can get ahead is not, it isn't really true in America anymore. Social so, mobility in this country has also, fallen below all low. most of Western Europe, where it's the thing that we've right. always hung our hat on. Right, so it's more likely that you can, if, you grow, if you're born poor, that you become rich in France than it is in the United States. So my view is a, more, is a, is a guaranteed income for, of about $500 a month for everybody who makes roughly the median wage on down, roughly $50,000 on down. So that would provide $6,000 a year per adult. So if you have a family, you know, if you have two adults working in a family, it's $12,000 uh, to ensure that people have uh, a floor they can't drop below. That is certainly not enough money to cause to anybody to stop working, drop out of the workforce. It's purposefully meant to be a, a supplement. And it's at a level that, that is affordable, I believe, in the context of all the stuff that's going on in the United States. And then if Elon Musk is right, if the futurists who claim that jobs are over are right, then we have a foundation to build on. The pipes will have been laid, and then when all of this abundance that they all predict arrives, then um, we can quickly adapt to, to, uh, uh, to, to a, more, a more robust, a more generous kind of, of structure. Let me ask you a quick 
personal piece of this, which is that you say in the book and you say in interviews that your experience at the New Republic, mm -hmm. which we haven't talked about, we don't have time to talk about much, but it was humbling, um, uh, influenced how you looked at this as well. Yeah, very much. For those, I mean, um, for those of you, maybe most of you know, I don't know, um, I came into, I bought a magazine called The New Republic, which is a political magazine that um, had mostly been based in D.C. for its history back in 2012. And uh, I'm happy to go into the details um, in depth if we, if, if we have the time and if there's interest. But the, the short version is I went in guns blazing. I thought that after, Obama, after Facebook and Obama, <laughs> all of these experiences had taught me that a small group of people focused on a hard problem with resources could figure it out. And um, I had the hubris to think that we could do that with old school journalism, that we could take the kind of journalism that The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New Republic, and others um, have done and uh, make it accessible uh, to a new generation of readers, and in so doing, find a, at least a sustainable business model, if not a profitable business model. And um, uh, I was the, you know, the last to come to the party and understand that the business model for a lot of these traditional outlets um, is fundamentally broken. And that uh, it's not just Facebook, but all of the technologies that have existed have, uh, have you know, threatened those models at their core. And that that kind of idealistic end that I so, like, I worked hard for and really wanted to make a reality was not going to, to happen. So I ended up selling the New Republic and there's another steward at the helm now who's taken it in a different direction. But the big lesson that I learned is that you don't have to shoot for the fences. You don't have to like figure out the perfect model for, uh, uh, for how to remake journalism. Instead, what I should have done is taken a more modest approach and said, hey, this thing is, never made that much money. It's not going to make money. Good quality journalism is, is a public good. Let's like lose a million dollars a year. I mean, we could have gone losing a million dollars a year for 20 some years at the rate that I, that that I was investing. That you spent to and try to save it, yeah. Unquestionably, that is, that is the, the, the approach that I should have taken. So the reason I talk about this in the context of the book is because the, the um, I, I learned that, that Sometimes modest means are the best way to begin work on a very idealistic goal. So for those of us who believe in the idealistic goal that no one should live in poverty, that we can create an income floor, that a UBI is the right way to do it, $1,000 to every American, uh, I, I am very much inspired by that and I think that we can and should get there in the future. However, today, I don't think that's the right approach. I think we should adopt more modest means um, to, to begin that change. work. And, me, I, and five years ago, I would have been a little, I would have been like, we got to go yeah, bolder. Yeah. And now I don't think that. And I think it's, uh, uh, in fact, more, more prudent and, and hopefully more impactful to start in a, in, a, in a more measured way. So let me ask, one thing I will point out, by the way, my guess is that with Facebook at first, you just wanted to get folks in college to like, at Harvard to like it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, think it, about it. It had no sort of world... Yeah. Yeah. World so let me ask you a couple of, a couple of things February. about your, your plan. Um, when you say that a household that makes 50 grand gets the supplement and a household that makes more than 50 grand doesn't, is this going to discourage marriage? Well, I think that, oh, I, so if people go above the 50, the 50, right, because yeah, you get both incomes. I mean, this is an attack that you'll get, I'm sure. There, there are a lot of big design questions here. So the marriage question, the question of how you do a phase out. So obviously if you make $49,999 and you make that one extra dollar, you don't, you're not going to structure it. So people lose it. So you have to have what the social scientists call a cliff that designs it that, um, well, you have to think about exactly how. Uh, we're defining a lot of the, the structures of the benefit. So I put forth a proposal that says that um, uh, we, we should take these into account. We should structure a cliff that is pretty steep, as they say, so that it preserves simplicity. When it comes to marriage, we should uh, exclude 
people so that uh, just as the, there is in many parts of the tax code now, there, there is not a marriage penalty per se. I think that we should do those things. I, the, my point in writing the book was to create a structure for a dialogue around the issue. And then through the work that we do at the group that I run, co-run now, the Economic Security Project, invest in the experts to create the policy papers, create the legislation, create the policy. And those folks helped in developing some of the initial numbers, and many of them are now running with the, um, with the, the even more specific ideas. Can you do, are you planning to do pilots on smaller scales? So start, we, with, start with a state, start with a city? Yeah, we have a pilot going on now, not so far from here. Uh, in Stockton, California, the mayor is one of the most inspiring um, uh, political figures out there. He's 28 years old. <laughs> This guy, his name's Mayor Michael Tubbs. He is um, a phenomenal leader. He grew up in Stockton. Uh, uh, his mom uh, worked multiple jobs, grew up very, at very, um, in a very humble background. His father's been incarcerated since, uh, more or less since he was born. And when he won a year and a half ago, he decided that he was going to advance a leadership agenda that he believed would be the most in line with his values and the values that he wanted to see in Stockton. So he was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. who talked a lot about this idea, a guaranteed income. And he came to us and said, I'd like to do a pilot. So the pilot that we've announced it will uh, begin, it looks uh, uh, likely this fall, where a certain number of Stocktonians will get about $500 a month for a couple years. There's also a pilot that another group, Y Combinator, is doing. There's a pilot up in Ontario. There's a pilot in Kenya. There are lots of people who are thinking about this, this idea. I think we need even more. Yep. And so we want to push the envelope, not just to get more social science research, but honestly to begin telling the stories of what people do. Because we have a lot of social science research that shows that you can trust people with cash. What we need more is um, the kinds of stories that you're already seeing you know, um, crop up in Stockton and other, yeah. other places. Now, just since I knew I was going to be interviewing you, two, things I, two headlines I saw in the last few days. One was that Finland... Mm. who had been, they'd been running a guaranteed basic income pilot for 5,000, I think, that was, it, you, you, you were jobless and you got the money, and they just are uh, ratcheting that down. Well, not exactly. They were running a cash transfer program to unemployed people that supplemented unemployment benefits. It's more like unemployment insurance with cash, and they had announced a two-year trajectory of it, and then they announced that they were not going to extend that pilot. So uh, the 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 I, that pilot has always seemed to me to be pretty uh, di different than what mm -hmm. the folks here in the United States talk about with a guaranteed income. And I think it was miscovered in the media. One of the things you see about the idea of cash in the media these days is there's a lot of people who are really interested in the basic income. Yeah. Now we're experiencing this like Backlash? skepticism yeah, yeah. of the idea. And I think that the way that the Finland news was reported was indicative of folks rushing out and reporting a story which um, actually isn't happening. They're, they're, the, and the Finnish government had to announce to, that, no, we're not canceling anything. We're just saying that we're going to see this through and not extend, not extend it, it, which is which is an which is an important. But the piece for them was that difference. they were particularly looking for the jobless, and your initial proposal says no, you've got to be working. Well, I think we have to expand the definition of work. Right now, there's this mythology out there that there are so many people who are just hanging out, <laughs> right? Like this is like it's no really. I mean, it's like it's, it crops up sometimes with. You know, young men who just play video games, or it's that old, you know, the specter of the welfare queen, which um, we know is not real. I mean, labor force participation, for instance, among African American women, higher than it is for white men. I mean, these are these are are our mythologies that do a lot of work, most often for the conservative right, and uh, no, and, yeah. and, and, and sort of vilify the kind of systems that I think we need to actually reinforce, if not expand. So what's actually happening in the country is that so many people are working, they're just not working in jobs that are part of the formal economy. So right now, tens of millions of people are involved in childcare, 
elder care, elder care. education, students in school, and all these people, I think, you know, conversationally, we would say, yeah, a young parent, a, a, a young mom taking care of a three-year-old at home all day, she's working, you know, or someone taking care of an aging parent, uh, someone in school who's studying for, they're working. Now, they're not getting paid for that. And right now, our social safety net says, no, mom, mom that you're doing that, that doesn't count. You got to go work at Burger King in order to qualify for all of these different benefits. And in benefits. fact, they're because adding, that work, the that Trump work administration counts. is adding that work right. requirements so, to things. So, so my view is that we, uh, we, we should provide guaranteed income to people who are doing anything to help themselves, to help their families, to help their communities, which is m the vast majority of people. And for those people like the disabled, for instance, or um, the elderly, that is exactly why the safety net itself should be reinforced, if not expanded. I do not believe we should cash in any of that stuff to pay for a guaranteed income. That is specifically there for people who, who, who can't work, who, yeah. who, who, who need that support. Interesting. When we were talking about regulation of the tech industry and the social media industry, you said it isn't an either or choice. We need regulation. And we need, and here again, it's not an either or choice. It isn't like we give a guaranteed income and pull away the safety net. I think that's right. And, and, um, and similarly, I don't want to sit up here and say that a guaranteed income or cash is a silver bullet. That is not true. Like, I mean, we need a higher minimum wage. We need better housing policy. I think we need more enforcement of, uh, of monopoly oversight. The concentration of power is, has, has become, uh, uh, problematic. I mean, there are so many things that we, not to mention education and job training and all the kind of classic stuff. There are so many things that we need. I do think, though, that sometimes we overlook the, the best solutions. Sometimes the simplest solutions are the best, and there is an immense amount of data that shows cash can be as powerful, if not more powerful, than many of the other benefits. So let's talk about all of these things that we do, but the reason I work on cash is because it, I, I think, is undervalued in the conversation and needs more attention. So we're gonna open it up to questions. I, I don't wanna leave this without asking you, how do you pay for it? You tax people like me. You raise taxes on the, 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 the luckiest, the people who have benefited the most uh, the, 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 the most significantly from the new economy. In my, what, what I call for in the book is raising taxes on income above 250,000 back up to where it was for much of the 20th century at 50%. That is uh, roughly 15% higher than where it is today. And it's the income above 250, right? So the income up to 250 would be taxed at marginal rates. So if you're making 300,000, let's say, you're gonna pay an additional seven grand. Your top 50, your last 50,000 is gonna be. Exactly. Yeah. If you're making $10 million, you're gonna pay millions more, which is, I think, the way it should be. And what we know from history is that when those rates were at that level, the economy grew much more significantly today, and the prosperity was broader shared. And that it's because it's an intuitive, uh, for me, it's intuitive. It's that if consumer spending is the biggest driver of economic growth, and you're using the money to, pro to, to help middle class people and poor people have more, more cash to be able to spend, that drives economic growth. I mean, it's sort of a classic um, Keynesian model. Now, that is not what everybody believes these days, but I, I think that that's what history has proven to be the most effective, and uh, and that's the direction that we should go in. Yeah, I mean, I heard a report as I was driving over here, actually, about what happened the last time we did a tax forgiveness amnesty and brought billions of dollars back in. Most of it went to stock buybacks. Well, you're seeing, you don't have to look. I mean, it's yeah. today. I mean, yeah. Apple announced a huge yeah. buyback yep. today. The Trump tax bill, which, by the way, is roughly on the order of magnitude of what I talk about in the book, uh, is, uh, is fueling record corporate profits. And the companies, which were in theory supposed to put it into R&D, they're buying back shares. And that is shorthand for saying that the shareholders, the top 10% of Americans who have a lot of stock in the, in the market, their stock's going up. The yeah. market's doing well, the yeah. record highs. And meanwhile, the income for everybody else is, right. continues to be Right, you, you say that, that, that the economy would grow as much as a full percentage point faster if the money, instead of being in the hands of the wealthiest, was yeah, spread around. Yeah, that's a Roosevelt Institute study. That's not, even, that's not my math. There's a study that shows yeah. that GDP growth over the next eight years would grow about seven points 
um, higher if uh, if we spurred consumer spending through a guaranteed income of five hundred dollars a month to everyone. Very good. Okay, Ted. So um, around here, questions start with a W or an H, uh, and sometimes a D. They are generally short. We do not believe in two-part questions, and only Terence McNally gets to ask follow-up questions. Um, those are my rules. Who gets to go first? Well, uh, my question is: um, What's the difference between um, uh, the tax, um, the, the current uh, tax laws, which uh, someone making fifty thousand supposedly is going to? Take home another 500. What's the difference between that and the cash uh, out, outlay? Tell me more about what you mean by the cash outlay. Well, in other words, you're saying give everyone five. Everyone who makes 50,000. What's the difference between giving them a check once a month or at the end of the year having them pay $500 uh, a less a month in tax? Oh, I see. Earning yes, the tax credit. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so. Uh, Folks who are making less than $50,000 now are paying a lot in tax. Their tax rates are higher than mine. They're paying it in sales tax, gasoline taxes, in some cases, uh, property taxes. They tend not to pay a lot in income taxes. So six grand, $500 a month, six grand would likely be more than anybody uh, making less than 50k would actually be paying on that federal um, federal tax return. So, um, and, and but but putting that like the math of the taxes aside, I think that one of the key things that I've learned over the past few years in talking with people who don't have income stability these days, the people who are in part-time contract jobs. Some of you uh, in the audience, I'm sure, are in them. So I'd encourage you to you know share your perspective with with all of us. Is that it's not just the, 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 the small amount of income, it's also the lumpiness, right? It's the instability. It's that some months you can do super well, and some months you won't have enough to make rent, and so you'll just go behind. I mean, it's, it's, and it's not just a Lyft driver, it's also a Starbucks worker who one week gets 10 hours, the next week gets 40, next week gets 20, you never know. It's like playing, it's, you, you never know exactly what you're gonna get. So it's not only that, um, that the tax math, as I was saying, uh, works out in, in, in a certain direction. It's also that I think that we need a kind of heartbeat of stability. Every single month, having the security to know that you're gonna uh, at least get halfway to making rent because you, or your par you and your partner have a guaranteed income to help, help make that possible. So I think that there are important um, uh, psychological effects that, uh, that, that uh, we know, I, I know from an anecdotal experience, but also some researchers have identified, some people are willing to take a pay cut of as much as 10, 15% if they know it's gonna be consistent. Well, that is because the way, at least that, that is the way Social Security on. works. It is the way pensions work. You yeah. know, we like knowing it's going to be there. And I think that the way that we structure this is through a monthly benefit, that it's either through a debit card or a direct deposit. It's administered as a tax credit, but you know, tax credits are, are what's called refundable. It, it, it's a cash transfer program, and it hits your bank account on the first of the month, every month. And, and we can start at $500 is, there's, I've thought a lot about the amounts. There's, I don't want to say that there's anything magical about $500. You could start this at a state level. Do this in California. You can't get to five hundred dollars, but you could do a hundred dollars. You do two hundred dollars for every Californian making less than fifty thousand dollars. The the California state budget is enormous. This would be a significant amount, but um, uh, but you could start you could start in the state at a more modest level, and then later on at the federal level. Hey there. Uh, do you see any opportunities to convert current social programs? to the model that you're talking about because it would deliver a better benefit than the money that's being spent and the way it is right now and the waste with bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. I know you don't want to pull the rug out from anybody, yeah. but I also think it seems to me there must be some kinds of programs, if not, not that it would be all of them, but there would be some that the money would be better used in the way right. that you're talking about. And what would those be in your mind? I, I, I think it's important not to do not to do harm, not for anybody, you know, let's say this, you know, magically or happens in a decade or something, 
um, something like that, that, that people um, not end up worse off than they were before. So that's one of the key reasons that I don't think that we should cash in the safety net. A lot of, historically, this idea has been very popular um, on the left and the right. Like Richard Nixon supported the idea, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. And the same period that Martin Luther King Jr. was out there um, talking about it. And even today, there are some folks who are interested in the idea and who do favor almost kind of a, a total cash in of the system. That would leave a lot of people worse off. I, I do think that there, I mean, with any, with any program, there are certainly some government programs that are less effective than others, and we should create a culture of transparency where we talk about what those are and, um, and how they could be improved. But in this particular moment, when the, uh, particularly Trump and the congressional Republicans are talking about, um, are, are trying to find ways to shred a lot of these benefits, but not to replace them with any kind of, of a program that I think would provide a similar benefit. I don't think it's, it's productive to focus on that. Instead, I think we should be thinking about the big aspirational goal, layer it onto the existing programs, and at the same time, as, um, uh, as, as we go, have a conversation about what's working and what isn't working in government. A lot of those programs do force poor people uh, to go from one government office to another to show that they still qualify, and they have all kinds of perverse incentives, which we could talk about, like not putting too much money in the the bank, and um, not even like I was in Jackson, Mississippi, a couple months ago, and uh, single moms couldn't get married again because if they did, they'd get thrown out of their housing. I mean, there are all kinds of problems. So, um, but I, I think that that we should start with a guaranteed income that's in addition to those benefits, rather than starting from a from a uh, uh, a point where we talk about cashing them in. Oh, well, he's taking a second. Have you spoken to some of the wealthy folks that you would hit up for this? And, and, and mm -hmm. what's their response? It diverges. Uh, there are some who think that this is crazy. I did an event. I, um, a month ago where I mentioned the tax rate up to 50% and I got a couple gasps from the audience. Um, it was a Harvard Business School alumni event. Um, so I'm there, going here for that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's the, there are those. I, I think that there are also a lot who, um, who worry that our social contract is coming apart. And that if people cannot expect that, they're, that, that their kids can do better than them, that the fundamental expectations of the way that the economy will work cause people to, um, to question not just the economy, but, but government and the social body together. Now, I am not of the school that Trump was elected just because of economic frustration. I think that was a, 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 a key reason. I think uh, you know, structural racism and the rise of white nationalism was a, a major reason. I think James Comey was a reason. I think Facebook was a part of it. I mean, I think a lot of these things worked in conjunction. I do think, though, that a lot of the wealthiest Americans um, do do feel that the, the 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 system is currently structured in a way to reward them and not everyone else. And you know, I, it, it's like um, uh, Bob Frank, the uh, economist, has this uh, uh, thing that he says often. You know, if you if you give a lot of rich people a world where they could buy a Ferrari for $300,000 and drive on roads that were full of potholes, uh, or if you gave those rich people $150,000 to be able to drive on nice clean roads and buy whatever kind of car, you know, the, the, they would consistently, you can't drive on the roads with potholes. You certainly can't drive a $300,000 car on it. So I think we're, we're, we are entering a period where, where a small group of people have so much money, they don't even, you know, it's not even, uh, uh, it, it's like, what, what, what are they gonna do? Just you know, live in the, the, the towers in, with themselves. I mean, that isn't the kind of country that I wanna live in, right. at least. And I think there are many, many wealthy people who, um, who also see it that way. Not all, but, uh, but some. Yeah. Robert Frank, who he mentions, a Cornell economist, has done great writing on a lot of this stuff. Um, uh from a state and federal level, is there anybody who you find to be sympathetic to this, particularly who, when you speak to, who seem like they're genuinely interested? Obviously, they're the ones who are gonna make the biggest help, us, help push these along. 
Yeah, there, there's, there's growing interest in it. I think, um, I think what's happening on the left right now is that we're, there's a lot of people perking up to big ideas, particularly economic ideas, and um, I think it's great. And, and there, this idea of around a modernized earned income tax credit or guaranteed income is one. Uh, a job guarantee is another uh, idea. Sanders uh, is proposing Sanders is, that. It, right he said speak. that he's yeah. going to propose yeah. it. Right. The headline was he's going to propose right. it, but that's guaranteed job Kirsten, for everyone. Right. And yeah. Kirsten Gillibrand is reimagining the post office that would provide a public bank that would not only in, enable people to have 50% of communities of zip codes in the U.S. don't have a, 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 a bank, so not only enabling access, but enabling access to low interest loans. So there's a lot of these big ideas that are floating around. So specifically on this idea, on the modernized DIA, I think, I think the more the, the, the better, uh, the more the better. Specifically on the modernized EITC idea, um, one, uh, 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 there are two leaders, Ro Khanna and Sherrod Brown, who've introduced a bill in uh, uh, the Congress, which is big, it needs to be bigger, uh, and it needs to uh, uh, have a few changes, but they're leading on it. Um, uh, this woman, Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor of Georgia, has, uh, uh, she had, doesn't yet have a plan out, but um, she's, very, uh, she's very interested in new ways to think about economic um, mobility. And there are a lot of mayors, a lot of mayors, um, who are, I think, in many ways, those who are the closest to the problems that exist and also feel the most open to new experimental kinds of solutions. So um, there, there are... There, I won't say there are a thousand flowers blooming, but there are a lot of people who are who are tuning in to, um, to to this as a concept. And now it's our job to you know amplify that and to to organize to um, uh, to support even more even more engagement and scrutiny. I'm from Connecticut, and I now live here in California. And I just want to know: Do you believe? that a guaranteed income can truly solve the homeless epidemic that we see here in Los Angeles? Not alone, no. Uh, I mean, I think homelessness is, is um, so complex um, and there's so many different reasons for homelessness. I mean, everything from queer youth who've been tossed out of their homes to substance abuse to people who um, have been recently let go and are months behind on a rent and who, um, uh, to domestic violence victims. And um, providing them inco uh, income support, I think, can be a key ingredient. But in every single one of those cases, there are other, um, other support services that are, um, are critical. So I, 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 don't, I think it's an important piece of the mix, but it's not the solution. One study, though, that I would flag that um, I think uh, can lead the way when it comes to homelessness prevention was done uh, at Notre Dame. And what they found is that if you provided people who were in stable housing with a one-time um, cash infusion, I, I'm going to get the exact number wrong, but the order of magnitude roughly, right, of like $1,000, 90% of them were still in their homes three months later, and 75% of them were still in their homes six months later. And the average bout of homelessness, I don't know about in California, but nationwide, is about costs taxpayers about $20,000. So if you, even if you just put the fact that, I don't think we want more people on the streets, like the moral reason to, to do this, if you just take a dollars and cents approach to it, it is so much more effective to ensure that people can be able to connect those dots and stay into their in their housing, then um, uh, you know deal with all of the complex challenges of restoring that housing after the fact. So what I would love to see is cash in conjunction with other services to address the the existing homelessness um, program, alongside um, a kind of um, cash infusion program of the one that I just described alongside uh, a real rethink of housing policy, which I won't get started yeah. in California, particularly here right now, because I read the news about it, but I am no expert. But I think it's those, that kind of, um, of, uh, of uh, structural approach that's, um, that's required. And we talk a lot about the housing um, reform now, but we, we don't talk so much about the role cash can play, and so that's the, that's the thing I want to inject into the One debate. thing I was meaning to ask you, which I hadn't yet, I'm gonna jump in now, is the recent research that has led us to realize 
how much the feeling of scarcity yes. affects people. Uh, Yes, I mean, for those, I have another book recommendation, which is um, not my own, but it's a good book that you should read, is, is called Scarcity by Elder Shafir and Sindel Muenthain. And um, there are so many studies that show that our cognition actually changes when we um, live in scarce environments. In some cases, in positive ways, like when there's only five minutes left in a meeting and you've got 10 more things to do, it can narrow the focus, narrow the conversation, all the extraneous stuff goes away. That's a positive example of it. And on these economic issues, there are many negative examples of it that when you don't know how you're gonna be able to make ends meet, you, um, uh, you, you, you suffer co cognitively in a significant way. One study that I cite in the book is they ask people in a mall in New Jersey, these are you know Harvard and Princeton uh, uh, social scientists and economists. They go to a mall in New Jersey and they ask people to um, think about what happens if they had a car accident or their car broke down and it cost them uh, $500. And you look at people who are middle class and you look at people who are, who are struggling and they take the aptitude test beforehand and afterward after you ask this question and you see like they're generally the same that they you know, have the same IQs and they also answer the, the question. And before and after you ask them this question, what would you do if your car broke down, cost you $500? You see them more, more or less the same. Then you ask the question, what would you do if your car broke down and it cost you $5,000? So you add a zero to it. You see that the folks who live on the brink, who experience the scarcity mindset, immediately start thinking, okay, I've gotta find $5,000. Shit, how am I going to do that? Who am I going to ask? What am I going to do? They have to you know, say what they're going to do. After that, they suffer a 14-point IQ drop on the same test, which is the equivalent of taking an all-nighter. So you know, imagine what it is like for you if, if, if you didn't sleep last night. What it's like, you, you, you just feel a little bit slower. You feel a little bit fuzzier because you're, you're stressed. And there's so many things going on. And what, what these researchers contend, not just in this one study, no, they it's have a, lot a of studies. whole yeah. lot of studies that show that you know, scarcity is actually decreasing the cognitive um, function of a lot of people, not in every moment, but in a way that I think we can, we can all agree is far, far, far from ideal. And, and so I bring it up because that's one of the things that knowing I've got that 500 showing up the first of the month may handle. It's the security. We have time for two more questions. <clears throat> um, besides just this, this sort of idea of like, like a bunch of super rich people, you know, wanting to keep their money, what, what do you think are some of the, uh, I guess, criticisms of things like the guaranteed income that we could take a little bit more seriously? I'm, I'm guessing it's not just all a bunch of greedy people, but there are like sensible sort of criticism to that and, and how would you, re so I, I, if you can imagine yourself debating somebody who's like a sure. lot more sensible but, but genuinely just disagrees with some of these things, what are some of the things that they would say and how would you rebut those? I think the biggest questions that I struggle with on this are um, how much and um, uh, instead of what? Because even here, you know, um, if you raise the revenue, if you raise the tax rates and you put it all in a guaranteed income, then what are you not investing in yeah. instead? You know, um, education is like the classic example. Shouldn't we just educate? And um, I think we need more money in, in education. Uh, absolutely. Social services. The homeless question is another perfect example um, of other services that, uh, that need to get funded. I think universal child care is something that I think a lot about. Child care rates, uh, the cost is, is so much more. So if you're putting this money in a guaranteed income and you don't have child care opportunities, um, that could be problematic. Same thing goes with health care. You know, if, if, should we use some of this money to pay for Medicare for all? And I, I mean, everything I just said in that list is something that I support. And the hard work, I think, is figuring out exactly um, how to balance these things. So how much money should go into a guaranteed income instead of into to healthcare or parts or any of these other, other things. So the, my, um, so fellow travelers, people who I talk to in this, in this work, um, the, the, the fault lines of disagreement are, are pretty rarely about 
yes or no to the, yeah, to the earned income tax credit or guaranteed income, and more about how much. Like they think, I'm up here talking about $500 a month, that's too much, it should be $250 for people who make 30 k on down, and we should do this. So those are, those are the, the um, uh, if folks were debating me, those would be the points that I would be the most sympathetic to, is, is saying that, that the, um, uh, the prior, we have to get all of these priorities right, and it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act to do so. And our final question. Final for the question. Evening. No pressure. Uh, I saw Richard Wolf about uh, a week ago at a large church in Mid Wiltshire, and he had some great ideas. And uh, a lot of what you've been mentioning, he covered too. Uh, he's from your neck of the woods, New York, Professor Economics. Uh, wondered if you appreciate his views by and large. I think I have more to learn from you about them than, uh, so I'm not, um, I'm not deeply familiar with his work. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> There's one more question up there. Yeah, can't leave on get that. one more. Like, we can't leave on a misfire. <laughs> with what you were saying about um, complexity in, in being able to pay, well, you talked about the complexity of what was needed, but you answered almost a simple answer with how to pay for it. And I was wondering, if you looked at that 50% model for the, the very basic, if you looked a little more complex in that taxing of you know certain percentages of different levels, because everything you're talking about is leading towards creativity, individuals being trusted to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And what we want is to incentivize that, that big you know, one percenter to be interested in buying into this model, fix their potholes. Do you have another answer, or like, could you spend a little more time in going into what you, how you were going to pay for it? Like, it's got to be more than just fifty percent of the one percent on their taxes. Well, I mean, there are there are a lot of other ways to approach it, but I do think that um, it's not just the rate. It comes with the expectation that in America we take care of one another, and that you know, everybody out for herself or himself is not um, not the kind of country that we've lived in historically. There have been periods of it that have been pretty bleak, I think, but uh, that's not been, um, uh, that's not the kind of country that I think we want to live in in the future. So it's not just the, the, the magical rate increase. I think it has to come with that idea. There are a lot of other ways to, to, to pay for this. Um, you know, there is the idea that we were talking about earlier about putting a tax on companies that profit from data. You could also tax financial transactions, a financial transaction tax. You could tax carbon and distribute the revenue from that as a, um, a dividend. That would be more like Alaska, wouldn't it? It would be a little bit closer to Alaska. Now, yes. each one of these has pluses and minuses. Carbon, for instance, um, in theory, you tax carbon and the amount of carbon that's being used goes on down and so then your source of taxation has disappeared, you don't have a long term. But that too could probably be, be solved. So I think, in the, I, I think in the long term it's a good thing to discuss a lot of these different ideas and I talk about a lot of these ideas. I mean the data dividend and taxing data is something that I'm thinking about a lot uh, these days. But I do think that we need more people making the case that the wealthiest in our country have seen runaway success in a fundamentally unfair way. And we should expect them to pay, we should expect people like me to pay our fair share. And in fact, it's not just philanthropy that can solve these problems. So much of the debate these days is like, well, I just want to give to like my charter school or like invest in this for-profit startup that's a B Corp and it'll be great. And you know, those things, there are great nonprofits, there are great B Corps. However, we need public policy in the long term to change, to, to, to craft this. So um, I do think that it is very important for, um, for the wealthiest, for the most successful, for, for as a society, for us to expect that we can and should rebalance those scales. And um, I, I think in the long term, it doesn't have to be a kind of populist pitchforks coming for the rich narrative. It can be more of this is what we owe one another and we want to take care of each other as, uh, as a country. But I, I think that that's, uh, that's a case that we need we need to make, and it's a case, quite frankly, that I 
want to make because I think more more uh, more of the wealthiest should should be making it. Let me ask you a quick question on that, which is it isn't merely changing the income tax rate. A lot of it would have to do with just making capital taxing capital gains more simply the way that we. Right, closing the loophole that makes it possible for Warren Buffett's assistant to pay a lower tax rate than, excuse me, to pay uh, a higher uh, tax, a rate, higher than tax rate than Warren himself. I mean, it's those kinds of things that, we, again, we have structured, we have purposefully created, we, political leaders, mostly on the right, have purposefully created in the tax code to, um, to make that possible in a way that, you know, that just wasn't true for much of the 20th century, and there's no reason that it should be true for the rest of the 21st. Okay. And on that note, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for thank the conversation. You.